are live. We got Harry W. We got Richie from Yes Media, Matt O'Leary, Iowan Jet Fan. we in the house. We got Dom C in the house. We got Steve live, CEO of the Jet Lounge. I knew I'd get rich on my channel. <laughs> See what's going on. Yeah, there we go. Good <laughs> by a million today. Yeah. Guys, jet fans everywhere, ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls, something is going on with our New York Jets, and I don't know if you have noticed. And one thing I've noticed is that Snacks is here. That's me, but the guy who named me is here. Jets mess mess. What's up, bud? It is Tuesday. Oh, I must have uh, froze for a second there. It is Tuesday, which means there was more OTAs. There's not going to be any activity for a while. Things are going to go kind of dormant until our Jets come back a week early and begin to plan for the Hall of Fame game. I don't know what that means, that they're coming back a week early. I don't know when they were supposed to come. I know you. Exp I think everybody has to be in camp by July first, right? I would think because you get preseason games in August. So maybe instead of June twenty eighth, we're going to be there June twenty first. I don't know, but the reality is, we're ready. We're ready for the biggest year we've had in a very, very long time. But I've noticed something. You know, I I'm sitting here watching on my screen on my monitor in the back of me right now, the NFL. Network for some reason is playing the Jets Miami game from 1994. Jets Miami 1994, week 13. I have absolutely no idea what happens in this game, um, but it says players' cho choice, Mark Ingram. And that just makes me think that this was probably not a good game for the Jets. It looks like Dan Marino was the quarterback for Miami, and I see number seven on the Jets side. I think it's a you know, I just saw it, uh, saw it real quick. So I, I, I guess Ken O'Brien was still on the Jets in 94. I didn't know that. I thought his career ended door due to a torn rotator cuff. Um, but apparently he played a lot longer with it. It's just why he was never as good because he was playing hurt. That's my excuse. Uh, Jennifer, I'm sorry, Rider of Karma. See, the problem with that is, is that it just, you know, that name doesn't show, doesn't do anything to show that's your Irish. You got it. Maybe writer of Car karma, I'm Irish. Or the Irish writer of karma. Or hey, laddie, writer of karma. Writer of karma for Lee Clover's good luck. Something, something that reminds us that you're Irish. And that you've been fighting all your life. That's why the Irish can fight, because you've been fighting all your life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shite. <laughs> we need some Irish in that name. But, but uh, seriously, well, let's, let's see. That's number seven. It's got to be O'Brien. He just fell down handing the ball off. Who's that at running back? Mitchell's at tight ends. I remember him. Moore is the wide receiver, but not Elijah. What was that? Rob Moore? Well, that's O'Brien, 1994. He just completed the pass to, who's that? Number 85. Don't tell me that was still Wesley Walker. No, that's Moore. So that's got to be like Rob Moore, Ron Moore or something. Man, I barely remember those 94 Jets. And believe me, there's a reason. They really were not worth remembering. They really weren't. Um, Yeah, it is Rob Moore. They just showed it <laughs> from Syracuse. That's right. I remember when we drafted him, Rob Moore out of Syracuse. Anyway, they got this game going on in the NFL Network. If you want to check it out, play in Miami. But here's what I noticed. I, you know, I put it in the title of the video, and I've noticed something. You know, like you know, first 
they show Michael Clemens a few weeks ago, and it's like, holy mackerel, right? The guy, if he wasn't already a monster, now he's like bigger and looks taller. I don't know what the hell. Like they put him in some stretch machine. I mean, he looks like this monster, <laughs> but he's like even bigger if that's possible, even more intimidating. Then I look at Carl Lawson. Suddenly, Connor Hughes is going crazy showing pictures of Connor Lawson. It's like, oh, my God. The baby fat is gone in his belly. He's this huge man, big muscles. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, these guys got together, didn't they? Or they made some kind of pact. And that pact was, we are going to terrorize the NFL next year. Let's get our bodies ready. I have never seen a Jets team with so many players that have come to camp so fit. Like, these guys didn't just, like, they're not coming off cruise ships and vacations saying and using OTAs to get back in shape. These guys are coming in in the best shape of their lives. Brees Hall's been in rehab, so he's so he's already cutting and on the, you know, he's been at the facility working out. We all know about Becton. He's at his lightest weight going into training camp. Looks better than he's ever looked. Um, that's exciting, too, because it's not just names on paper. We're watching these guys. You know, when's the last time Aaron Rodgers participated in OTAs? You know, if you look for at Green Bay, he hasn't done that since they pissed them off. He's here working out, and if any of you saw some of the passes he's throwing, especially one that was like 50 yards in the air and came down into the receiver's hands, it's looking really good. It's more than just names on paper. These guys are fit. They're in the best shape of their lives. They are absolutely on the same page. They're determined. They want to win. They want this. They're not just here for a paycheck. This is the most motivated team that I have seen in many, many years. These are a group of players who love each other, who love the fan base, who love being Jets, and they want to win. And that's exciting. Ken O'Brien, wide open 86. Isn't that Mitchell, the tight end? I got to say, that was a beautiful play. Man, that was Mitchell. I have a good memory. I don't know if you remember, we drafted, you know, Mitchell was this tight end that was going to be like our best receiving tight end since Schuler. Um, he only lasts a couple of years and then something happened. He just kind of disappeared, never panned out, but he looked good on that play. Yeah, that was cool. Uh, NFL Network, if you want to check it out. A man amongst men, Michael Clemens. Good decision to cancel mandatory OTAs. I agree. I agree. They're coming a week early anyway. They've been working hard. And I think that once in a while, you got to be a player's coach too. Besides, John, at this point, since they're going to be back in a few weeks, right? Training for the Hall of Fame game. You got to think the only thing that can happen in OTAs at this point is an injury, right? Like if they would have, if they didn't cancel them, they didn't, if they didn't cancel him, you could almost feel it, that an injury was going to come. Somebody was going to tear something. To me, it's like, guys, be ready, be in shape, be fit. I'm sure they'll be in the film room. Like I'm sure that you know Rodgers is doing what he has to do. I'm sure the guys are studying the playbook. That's all great, fine and dandy. But, man, practices scare me because you get those crazy reports, those injury reports that just deflate the hell out of you. So as far as I'm concerned, there's risk anything. You know what I mean? Just, you know, just you do the minimum of what you got to do to be ready. I'm not saying don't work hard, but I'm saying, like, as far as the contact and the cuts and the this and that, scares the hell out of me, man. Scares the hell out of me. And they got to be careful with Becton, right? We need him to at least start the season. Can't watch him go down and practice again. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think Clemens is going to be. I'm excited to see him at tackle. I'm excited. I, you know, I, to me, that's the feel. I feel like that's what he should be. He's a big, strong bully. And I think he should be in the middle next to Quinnen. And I think that if they double team Quinnen, that Clemens is the kind of guy that's going to, he has an ego 
and he's going to make them pay. And I think he'll be a disruptor. He's physical. He's intimidating. You want him in the trenches. I want him on the field as much as possible. Maybe that's why we didn't draft an interior defensive lineman. Maybe that's why. Maybe because it's we got Michael Clemens. We picked up some guys, the guys in free agency. That's all fine and dandy. We got some veterans, got a guy from Seattle. You know, all that's nice and fine. But I think that Clemens could be the force. Clemens could be the guy that makes Quinnen unstoppable because it, he might be the guy that says you can't double team him because if you focus too much on Quinnen, I will make you pay. He is a badass. I'm excited about him. He could be a really solid player for us. Like last year, he contributed. This year, he could be significant, which is crazy when you look at the players on our defensive line. It's absolutely crazy. The more I think about it, the more I think we might end up with the best defensive line in the NFL this year. Might be the best defensive line. I mean, we might not have that one superstar who gets 20 sacks, but what we have is eight freaking guys. I mean, let's name them. Let's name the real deal guys. The air quality is all messed up too. I don't know if it's affecting you guys down in the city. What's here in the in Canada? Oh, by Canada? I don't know what's going on with you. I thought you lived in the Rockaways or whatever, where the Ramones are from. Because, you know, where all the Irish live. You know, like in Brooklyn when you went to Gateway and then you went over to, what was that, Reese Park, Rockaways? Isn't that where you were? I just imagine you in those Irish bars in the Rockaways. Singing stuff like, her eyes, they shone like diamonds. Well, never mind. I am just a leader. I am going to the evening. Okay, anyway, let's name the eight guys. When I talk about the deepest, deepest defensive line in the NFL. Okay, let's start with Carl Lawson. Okay, year after the Achilles. He had a good year directly after the Achilles. This will be a better year, right? So you got Carl Lawson. Okay, that's a real guy. I'm going to just name the ones I consider real guys. JFM, real guy. He could play on the edge. He's a great edge sealer. A man who can seal the edge, probably the best on the team at it. Although we got a young buck I'll talk about coming up along the ranks that does a pretty good job himself. JFM could get to the quarterback, could play a little on the inside, could start on the outside and stunt into the inside. We're paying him uh, 13, 14 million for a reason, a little inconsistent. But dangerous, dangerous guy. If you if you don't pay attention to JFM, it'll hurt you, right? So what did we say? We said Carl Lawson, JFM. Now let's go to JJ, Jermaine Johnson. Outstanding rookie year. Didn't get a lot of snaps, barely played in pass situations, yet got sacks when, when given the opportunity. But more importantly than that, played at an above veteran NFL level in his rookie year at sealing the edge. Like, absolutely fantastic. One of the reasons Josh Allen couldn't do shit against us. Because not only was he great, and he, is he great uh, at sealing the edge, but he bounces off blocks. And if you come out of the pocket as a quarterback, he's going to hunt you down. And he's going to get you, and he's going to make you pay. So that's Jermaine Johnson, right? So that's three guys, right? Now let's get into Quinn Williams, the captain of the defensive line. Probably the captain of the defense. The um, well, he got CJ Mosley, but but he, you know, Quinn Williams is a leader. We saw that last year. He's he's the one that spoke out, screamed, went nuts, lost his mind, and then the defense never looked back. Right. So you got Quinn Williams, potentially the best defensive tackle um, after Irons Arnold in the NFL. So you're talking about number two. You know, you want to argue it? Okay, fine. We'll say top five. But I don't see how you're going to name four guys that's better than Quinn Williams right now. At the, at the way he's playing. So that's four, 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 right? Now I haven't even mentioned Michael Clemens, right? So Michael Clemens, already a disruptor on special teams, already doing great things for us on special teams, already showed he was effective against the run, already causing disruption in the backfield, already showing good pass rush skills, another rookie playing beyond expectations. Right. Then we move along and we say, Will McDonald, right, hasn't played a snap 
in the freaking NFL yet, but I don't care. I'll go on a limb and I'll say it. He is an athletic freak, and I cannot wait to watch this kid play. It's going to be absolutely fantastic watching this lunatic play and hit the field because the guy jumps over cars. He's a lunatic. He's big. He's fast. If you look in college, when you line him up wide, he is unstoppable. He is unstoppable. Offensive line makes a single mistake, the tiniest little mistake in their technique, and this kid jumps all over it. He is going to get multiple sacks his rookie year. He's going to be a force right away. Oh, my God. And we have Bryce Huff. Bryce Huff, one of the best get-offs in the NFL, was held every play, by the way. That was the only way they were able to stop that kid. They were holding him like crazy. One day, maybe Aaron Rodgers will run out into the field and talk to the rest, and they'll actually treat us like they treat New England and actually call the penalties that are against, you know, that that teams are committing against us. And we'll actually start getting those holding calls, so they'll actually have to learn to block Bryce off without freaking holding on to him. So that's seven defensive line I just mentioned and talked about that I'm excited about. Seven. Do I love Solomon Thomas? Nah, you know. I mean, but for your eighth guy? Or what's the other kid's name that we got from Seattle? For your eighth guy? What, Tenzel Smart? I mean, any of those guys as an eighth guy in, on your depth chart on defensive line. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Because he's a hard worker. No one argues that. No one denies that he's a hard worker. So the defensive line is absolutely insane. But what makes them that much more insane is that they look better than they have looked in ages. We miss good. Showing up to camp. I saw Johnny Ramon in his last tour before he died. Holy shit, that dude was tall. Yeah, man, the Ramones were all tall, right? They were like tall, thin. I, I call them, like, it's like they were four Howard Stern. I mean, Joey Ramone was a freaking Howard Stern. He looked like Howard Stern. He's like this tall, peaky guy. Um, I saw them. They were, my, they were my first live club show, first punk show, first live show of, like, a real band. Um, and it was in Lemoore's East in Brooklyn. And, man, if I tell you I was holding on to the walls of that bar doing everything I could to not get stuck in that freaking mosh pit because I would have gotten killed. And people were slam dancing and stuff, and they were throwing beer onto the crowd. And all I remember is, is Johnny Ramone going, one, two, three, four. And they would break into a song, and they were playing it so fast. You know, sometimes you couldn't even tell what they were playing until they got to the chorus. You know what I mean? Like, like eventually it would be, be on the bat with the baseball bat. You know, uh, it was crazy. It was crazy. But, uh, you know, I mean, you know the songs. You can't, you know, when, when they start going 20, 20, 24 hours ago, I want to be sedated. And then uh, uh, what was that? Was it Susie? Susie was a headbanger. Her mother was a geek. Something like that. <laughs> there were some good ones, man. Those guys were crazy. Let's see who's out there. Chris Bradigan, what's going on, buddy? The Jets show is in the house. What's up, the Jets show? You are a funny guy. You're in L.A. enjoying the food, enjoying Los Angeles weather. The Jets show. You're a funny dude, man. You're a funny guy. You make me laugh. You got to get you on. <laughs> he's a funny guy. He's living in L.A. and he's a Jets fan. You got to love him. You got to love him. What is that? Chaos stutter. I'm not stuttering. Do I stutter? Read my lips. The Jets are winning the Super Bowl. Did I stutter? Did I stutter? Twisted ain't going that far yet. He ain't saying that we're winning the Super Bowl. He's not going that. He's not going that far. Yeah, I think McDonald's going to be a problem. I do. I honestly do. I don't think it's going to take time. I think he's like one of those guys. It's going to be. He's going to be a more a bigger impact than JJ. Um. Because JJ's had an impact. He's great at sealing the edge, but that doesn't stand out like McDonald's going to stand out. Because when Josh Allen drops back and McDonald's just literally slices through the tackle that tries to block him, and he just head on nails Allen and puts him on the ground in week one on Monday Night Football, the world is going to take notice. 
It's going to be great. I can't wait. I can't wait because our, it's not just like the one player. Again, it's that our entire defensive line, like rotating, is just filled with playmakers. It's filled with playmakers. At any moment, JFN could break through and be the guy that makes the big play. It could be Clemens that makes the big play. He had a bunch. It could be Jermaine Johnson making a great tackle behind the line of scrimmage um, and, you know, and, and, and just crushing their running back. It could be freaking Carl Lawson or Bryce Huff. I'm I, Quinn Williams getting the – imagine Quinn Williams – and Carl Lawson or Mel McDonald getting there at the same time. It's going to be vicious. We are going to terrorize the other team's quarterbacks. That's the plan. Fun. When we play another team, the idea is they should not be having fun. They should be frustrated. That's what we want. And we got the team to do it. And by the way, by the way, all that pressure coming – it's not like you could quickly just throw it to a receiver on a quick out because DJ Reed and Gardner, if if you're only asking them to cover someone for under four seconds, sometimes just two to three seconds until the quarterback's feeling pressure, those guys are just too good. They're not, you know, you're not getting open against them within a Man, I'm I'm freeze bean. I'm frozen chaos today. I don't know what the hell's going on. I need to fix this connection. It's not good. It's not good. But as I was saying, what I, I cannot stop obsessing over our defensive line. But it's it really is going to make everything better. I mean, like, the, don't get me wrong. Our secondary is great. I mean, when you talk about our trio is amazing. I mean, you got the best cornerback in the NFL. There, I said it. Sauce Gardner. You got DJ Reed, who's top 10, underrated. And you got Michael Carter second, which is probably one of the slot best slot corners in the game, right? What is top? I mean, no one would argue top 10. I guess you can argue top five. I don't know. It's hard to judge them because sometimes, like, you know, like they'll say, oh, he gives up more passes, but it's like an average of 2.5 yards, and their freaking defense allows those short passes that's like that's just like every defense has to give up something we give up tiny passes that's the way our defense is and i know it's frustrating for us but you have to give up something when you want no big plays when you're forcing them to get you um with big plays when you're pressuring the quarterback when you're you know like when you, and you challenge them to beat you with the run and short passes and you give them space for short passes the trade-off is you're saying we're going to make it that yeah they get a few yards and then it gets the third down and then we're going to lock them down and we're going to make the big play that's how we play it that's how it feels um the only problem we had, like in the beginning, two years ago specifically the problem we had was they would do those screen passes and those short plays and they would get first downs they get 10 yards of play. But when we, we hold them to two or three yards on both those first two plays, and now it's third and five, third and four, that's where we have to step up and get off the field. And that's when our guys step up to the line of scrimmage. We give them a different look, and we don't make it so easy for them. And that's when we challenge them to try to beat us a little deeper in the field. And that's when you're going to be taking on Sauce Gardner and DJ Reed and you know throwing into traffic. So I have I have it all figured out. Jeremy Studer, it's chaos. I don't know what the hell you're saying, man. <laughs> uh, then short passes will receive big hits. We just need to recover for a change. Yeah, look, you're right. I'm tired of causing fumbles and not getting the ball. They're gonna they're gonna have to work on that. Oh, you know what? It wasn't Ken O'Brien. It's Boomer Esiason. <laughs> That's it. That's it. It's Boomer Esiason. I remember him as a Jet. Oh, there's 81. I don't know who the hell that is. I forget. Running for a touchdown. Running for a touchdown. He's oh, is he in? I think he's in. He may have been pushed out of the last second. Who's 81 for us? Back in 1994. 
I don't know. I'll tell you in a second if they show his name. It's not more. Monk. Art Monk from the Washington Redskins. I remember we got him. People forget Art Monk was a Jet. People forget that. Twisted forgets that all the time. Like, Twisted just, like, forgot everything about this team. Twisted doesn't know that Thomas Jones was a Jet. Twisted doesn't know that, that Art Monk was a Jet. Twisted doesn't even know that Eric Decker was a Jet. Like, we have to remind Twisted of these things. Anyway. It's my freeze bean imitation. It's Tuesday. I don't even know if they're on those guys. Aren't they on vacation or something? Like, is anyone live today? I mean, it's been dead. I've never had so few people in here after being on this long, in a long time. Like, right? It is dead. Like, where are all the Jet fans right now? It's completely dead. I don't know what's going on. I mean, it is early. I don't usually go on at this time. 5.36 on a Tuesday. But, uh, you know, I didn't realize that no one was going to be here. It's like, what What do you people work or something? I mean, look, I'm trying to look and see if anybody else is online. I don't see anybody else doing a show. Where is everybody? I don't understand. You don't want to talk Jets? It's freaking Tuesday. We had OTAs today. There were press conferences today. There's our guy. You know, you know, you know what uh, proud New York Jets fan says to me today, Nick Shine. He's like, "Who's Tony Alexia?" It's like, what are you kidding me? Who's Tony Alexia? Who is Tony Alexio? I'll tell you who Tony Alexio is. Tony Alexio is the Chris Trevor package. Without Tony Alexio, there is no Chris Trevor. There is none. So in this Jets game, we're winning 17-0. 1994, game 13, we're winning 17-0. Why do I have a bad feeling? Why did Mark Ingram choose this game to be aired? I have a bad feeling. You love the chaos package? Well, I love the Alexio package. Tony, did you send your information to Green Bean yet? Because what's-his-face... The Italian jet, Italy jet, needs to send you. Uh, he's going to send you that thing that you want. You want a pretty cool prize. You got to collect it. So make sure you send, make sure you reach out to those guys on Twitter, get them their address, or send it to me, and I'll pass it along for you. Happy hour, five thirty. Oh yeah, I mean, did I really expect a lot of people to be here? Everybody's in the bar right now. It's like freaking th four dollars for. Uh, mozzarella sticks and three dollar freaking domestic beers right now i like that jennifer knows that it's happy hour <laughs> that's <laughs> i could just see her in some irish bar in far rockaway <laughs> getting her beer getting her drink it's happy hour don't mess with me i'll kick you in the head you think i'm a girl i, I can't mess you up i will i'll kick you in the head spread some margarine and some marriage On your head too. We the people is here. So guys have no fear. Here is Chiefs Live who cannot wait to play us. And I don't blame them. It's going to be a great game. Feels like we haven't played the Chiefs in a while. I mean, we did, but I don't count it because we weren't competitive. This is the first time we're playing the Chiefs since we've become a team that believes we have a chance to beat anybody. Like we didn't get to play them last year. So it's going to be interesting. I'm hoping that they're going to have the old uh, <coughs> Super Bowl hangover. <coughs> because sometimes the Chiefs are a team that wins the Super Bowl. They come out and they start the couple of games and they get pissed. And then they, they turn it on, right? And they start winning every week and then they get great again. So that's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping since we play the Chiefs kind of early in the season – that they don't got it together yet. You know what I mean? They need a slap in the face, like a wake-up call. Like, we beat them, and it's a wake-up call. Like, whoa. whoa. Mahomes is like, hey, guys, we got to start playing. And then they can start winning. But but I'm, I'm hoping that we sneak in and we're that team. You know what I mean? 
I'm making you so nostalgic. And it's so funny because it's all bias that I get from like TV, from watching Ray Donovan. You know what I mean? When they're in the bars. <laughs> Mickey, you, you, Ray, you, Ray, it was you, Ray. Uh, I froze again. What did you do, Ray? What did you do? It's the best show, Ray Donovan. It's the best show. The show the bars and like they're in Boston and their bar and everything. It's like that's so awesome. The one, the one brothers, the boxer. It's like someone messes with them. Ah, oh, it's over. And the wife is tough as nails because she's Irish. Last time was 2020. That was the last time we played you, right? And it, but that wasn't even a game. That was a joke. That was a joke, if I remember correctly. If anything, I was surprised because I thought you'd blow us out more than we were blown out. Because it wasn't as much of a blowout as I thought. Like I would have, I would have made the point spread for that game thirty points, and the Jets would have covered if I did. Look at all the Jets fans. Beautiful. <laughs> It's not enough here, man. It's dead. It's dead. Dead. I almost shut the channel down for a few months. And someone said, nah, don't, do, don't shut it down. Do some videos. Do some live shows. Don't shut it down. But I was like, but it's dead. Like, it better pick up. Where is everybody? Where's Ab Lab Studios? Well, Jennifer answered the question. Everybody's in the bar right now. Drinking. <laughs> It's weird. I had trouble. You know, Friday was a good day for me to do happy hour. You know, like Friday, you know, rush to the bar after work. It was always hard to do it during the week because I was a wuss. Like the next day, I couldn't get up. You know, I I just I didn't have that that ability to recover and be productive in life. And I'm sure Jen gets up after putting ten down. And she just wakes up and she's like, oh, here we go. I'm ready for another day. And I make it to happy hour so I can get some more some more booze in me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I well, that's not me. I'll wake up and I'll be like, oh, I got a headache. I'm hurting. I was like, oh, my God, I can't do anything. Uh, I'm basically a wuss. I've had people come up to me. You want me? You want me to put a nipple on that bottle for you? <laughs> Proud New York Jets fan. That's Nick Shine. He says I'm not in a bar. Well, you better not be in a bar, bitch. Kick your ass if you go into a bar. But um, yeah, that's right. I can kick his ass. People don't understand. I'm fast. I got moves. And you know, Nick just had um ACL, so he can't do shit. He's like limping or hopping around on one leg. I'll dance around him. Pop. Give him a little pop. Poof. Poo poo in his back, like I'll spin around and poo poo poo, poo poo. Then he'll turn around and I'll freaking do like a roll where I roll, like a judo guy. Like I'll hit the deck and do a spin move and pop up back behind him and go poo poo poo. And then you know what I mean. And I could just see Nick because Nick would be saying, "I just need one shot," right? He'd be like rearing his fist back. I just want one shot, chaos. I just need one shot. I could see him like wiggling his fist around. I just need one shot. And I'm just dancing around them like Muhammad Ali, baby. I'm the Jewish Muhammad Ali. Dance like a butterfly, sting like a bee. No one eats matzo ball soup quite like me. That's right, Nick. Kick your butt, buddy. <laughs> see, he validates it. He agrees. He agrees that I could crush him. He agrees. <laughs> oh, no, he says, I'd let you. <laughs> oh, kick your butt. You'd let me kick your butt. Oh, yeah, yeah. Jeremy has the reflexes of a cat. <laughs> that was my friend Brian Greer used to talk like that. He was a stoner too, weed. He'd be like, mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly how he talked, by the way. Mm hmm. I have cat like reflexes. Mm hmm. In college, he used to say it all the time. He used to say, I'm going to be a lawyer someday. I'm going to have so much money. And you know what's annoying? He is a lawyer, and he does have a ton of money. But uh, I still call him up and leave messages for his wife. I leave messages for his wife. I'm like, I just want you to know 
that your husband talks like this and says that he has cat like reflexes. Mm -hmm. She cracks up. She's like, holy shit, he sounds like my husband. I'd never hit you back. You never hit me back. Yeah. <laughs> so you'd be like, like Nick would be like, let, I'm gonna let him have his moment. I'm gonna let him have his moment and feel like a real man for a second. Muhammad Ali Berg. <laughs> <laughs> Johamed Ali, Johamed Ali. <laughs> oh my God, this is hysterical. Peter, would you verse big? Would you verse Bagel Boss in a in a TV? <laughs> what? But a one verse one. Who's uh who is uh Bagel Boss? Is Bagel Boss like some kind of fighter or something? I don't know Bagel Boss. I kind of offended like that. Nobody wait a second. Nobody is more of a boss when it comes to bagels than me. I've been eating bagels my whole life. I lived in Canarsie. We had bagel corner. We had Flatlands bagels and Bell Bialis and bagels, baby. I know all about the bagel. I know all about the bagel. I could scarf down a bagel or two, let me tell you. Nobody's the boss of me, the boss of bagels. I'm the boss of bagels. And come the uh, slats with the following chair. With the folding chair. <laughs> oh, man. I love it, those folding, when they hit the, each other on, on the head with those folding chairs. Nick would just hold out a bagel with his left hand and could cock you with the right. Because <laughs> I would go for the bagel. I'd be like, oh, bagel? <laughs> but I'll tell you. Oh, he's some guy from New York City who dipped out of a fight. <laughs> uh, let me tell you something. That's what, that's what happens when I see people live. Nick was like, hey, what happened? I thought you were going to beat me up and everything. And I'm like, oh, you know. I I pulled the muscle in my back. I'm not feeling so good. How about we go? We'll go to the store. We'll get ourselves some pastrami on some rye. We'll get a nice pickle, a sour pickle. And I, I get out of it. I talk my way out of it. I've talked my way out of many, many beatings. I'll tell you that much. I've had to talk my way out of a lot of beatings. I've used my mouth because I have a big mouth. So then I end up putting myself in a situation where I have to talk really fast to get out of it. I don't know, Nick just sent me a picture or something. I don't know what it is. It looks like a picture of a baseball field or something. Uh, Bagel Boss is five foot two. Oh, is he the guy? I saw, um, I saw a video on Instagram. This little guy, and he was just screaming at people in the store. Like, for no reason. Like, they didn't do anything to him. He's, like, yelling at some woman. I know what you're staring at, and I'll get your butt. Like, are you talking about that guy? Some guy put him down. Some guy, like, threw him down on the ground and got on top of him. I don't know if that's who you're talking about, but I saw a great video on Instagram with a guy that fits that description. And I think they were in a bagel store, too. He is the bagel boss. Battling Lewinsky. Man, I got new glasses. It doesn't help. I can't see a freaking thing. Jeremy is the bagel boss. That's a lock. I mean, is it possible to be a bagel boss and at the same time be the pizza boss? Or maybe that's just in my head. Any call, any call in time. <laughs> yeah, that's him. Oh, okay, okay, that's him. Yeah, I saw that one video of him. Are there more? Like if I do a search on Twitter, uh, on Instagram for bagel boss, I'm going to do that. There'll be more of him because that looked real, right? That was real. He was like pissed off and some guy just couldn't like he kept running his mouth and some guy just had enough and just fucking went at him and threw him on the ground. But the guy is like crazy, man. He needs like serious therapy. Like because they weren't bothering him. He was just screaming at everybody. It's like, does that he just walk through life doing that? Just walks through life in the street yelling at people. Yeah, you don't mess with me. You think because I'm short? <laughs> Crazy. Check your phone. Just sent you a picture of the air quality of Sophia's practice. Oh, you were sending me air. Are there like fires going on over there or something? Because usually that's like a California problem. 
Is something going on like that I don't know about? Like, what's going on with the air quality? What's happening on the East Coast? Usually we get the fires and have the bad air quality. So I don't know what's going on. I remember there was a time a couple of years ago, the, there was so many fires here in California, and it was so bad, the air, that somebody from New Jersey called me up, and it was on the news, that it literally went that far. And was starting, people were smelling it from freaking New, from New Jersey. That, which is just insane to me. That's the guy. I got. I got. I got to look that up. Oh, big fires in Canada. Oh, that sucks. That sucks. Shit. Hope they get that under control. Fires are scary now, man. It's scary stuff out here in California. I mean, I'm kind of like in a city, and we're surrounded by lots of farmlands. So I think like the downtown Sacramento is fairly safe, except our issue in Sacramento, not so much this year. I mean, we had more rain than we've ever had. I mean, it's like crazy amounts of rain. But in the past, when we have droughts here, everything gets so dry. And when it gets windy here and it's dry and we're a city of trees, they call Sacramento the city of trees. We got trees lined up on every block. Um, the fear is, is that if a house catches on fire for whatever reason, it could take out a whole block. It could spread really fast. So that's the fear is like there's ever a really big fire in Sacramento. How many houses could affect it? Maybe burn half the town, you know, so it's, it's kind of scary. But there's uh, like my friend's house burned down. One of my best friends, you know, Google Glenn, the guys who you know, Googles all those answers for me. His house three years ago, three and a half years ago in Sacramento. And it wasn't his, it was the house next door, like adjacent on another street they shared a backyard and it literally went up the tree and then spread across the branches and went into his house four houses were affected his entire house burned down i mean it was standing but it was like it had to be regutted and redone thank god he had great insurance now now it's a palace he's back in the house is beautiful everything's brand new it's great but man, for two years, then the, uh, they had to live in a separate place. It was they they you know the insurance gave them all the money, but they lo you lose everything you own. It's crazy, crazy. It sucks, dude. It's so bad in New York City. I can't believe it, man. Shoot, I'm sneezing just being outside. That was like before the the pandemic. We were wearing masks. Like, it wasn't the pandemic that we were wearing a mask. Like, it was weird. The pandemic happened. But the truth is, before the pandemic, we had all these fires. And the fire departments were giving out masks for that. Because the air is so unhealthy. Like, when the air quality is low, especially if you have any problem with your lungs, if you're older, people had to wear masks. And you can't go jogging outside. And people do anyway. Because they're like, oh, it's not that bad. And it's like, because they don't, they don't realize just because you can't see it. Or just because you don't feel it, like you just because you can run two miles and, and you're thinking, oh, it just smells a little smoky. People don't understand all that bad air is going into your lungs and it's really bad. So, guys, stay inside. Don't mess with it. It's not good. Tell me, I'm, I'm becoming, you know, when you live in California, you learn all about it and you see the effects of it. Do not mess with bad air quality. Like, do not be outside exercising, straining yourself when the, uh, when the air quality is bad. It is, it is not worth it. Insurance, you don't need it until you do. Hurricane Irene thought taught me that in the mid-20s. Yeah, man, I look, every single friend of Glenn, including myself, not we didn't even know. We like he just told me when we told him, he said, Yeah, everyone's telling me that. Every single one of us independently after that day, because we all ran over there, we were helping him try to get stuff out of the house, like you know, like we were helping like guard the house and like put things in carts. But every one of us within 24 hours called our insurance broker to find out what our coverage was because his insurance was great. They literally gave him a check for five grand literally that evening. They like, they gave them a cash check or something. So they immediately could have money to go if they needed a hotel and if they needed to buy clothes. Now, of course we're a tight community, you know, no one's going to have to go to a hotel or be worried about homeless when they're my friend, right? But my other friends, like their other friends, our other friends, 
they had more space than we have. And their kids were already best friends and used to sleep over their each other's houses anyway. So they stayed at my friend Mark's house um, for a while until they found until they rented a house. And the insurance company covers the covers the cost of the rental. So you continue to pay your mortgage, you go back to your life to work, but you're renting a house now. The insurance is paying for that. The insurance paid for the rebuild of the house, unless you want to add extras, then you got to pay a little extra. And the insurance gave them a flat sum of money. Some are different. Some give you a flat sum of money to replace your clothes and all your possessions. They'll just give you like a hundred thousand dot, whatever your coverage says. Um, and some, you just have to write it all out estimates. And when you buy it, you send them the receipts. Um, so I hope I have the one that just gives me a sum amount. Just give me the sum amount. I want to sit there collecting receipts, but anyway, yeah, man, make sure you have insurance. If you own property, you get that shit insured. And if you're renting an apartment and you have a lot of expensive things and you've been living there a while, rent is insurance is cheap as hell. It doesn't cost a lot. So it's really dumb to work out outside during these conditions. Yeah, man. Yeah. No, I mean, hey, it's like people go into fires and they come out like, you know, people that are in fires come out and they think they're okay and then die. Because they breathe, they breathe in too much smoke. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's like just don't do it. Don't don't go out there, um, especially if you if you could see it like that. Like if it looks hazy, it's the air is very very bad. Because in California, it doesn't look that bad. Um, there's a lot of times we could smell it, but the air looks clear. Like you wouldn't know it looks fine outside. And like, but if you look, the air quality is really bad. You're not supposed to be out there in it. <laughs> Uh, let's see. It's really, oh, okay. So, yeah, so I was getting stuck. I can't believe I'm watching this Jet game. I don't remember this game at all. But, like, they're totally dominating the Miami Dolphins. And Mitchell, the tight end that we drafted, that must have been one of his best games. Boomer is just on fire. All I remember is the bad. Pete Carroll was the coach. Pete Carroll was the coach. So that's when we had Pete Carroll as a coach. If only I can go back and, I, I mean, I don't know, you know, eh, it's dangerous to play with time. You know what I mean? If I can go back in time, I'd tell them, don't fire Pete Carroll, keep him. But like, maybe Pete Carroll needed to get fired. Maybe he needed to be the defensive coordinator for San Francisco. Maybe he needed to then to go to USC. Maybe he needed all that to become the coach he ended up becoming. He's a great coach, by the way. Great coach. You know, some people, I hate it when people, like, don't know that. No, no, he had good play. No, no, no. Pete Carroll is a great coach. <laughs> he is a really great coach. Um, just watch him on the sidelines. He is a great coach. Um, but anyway, if I could try, if I could go back in time and give my, I, I would only go to, back to talk to one person. It would be me. And I would tell myself one thing. Bitcoin. And 2009, Jeremy would put every penny he had in Bitcoin, and I would be a billionaire right now. And I'd be chartering planes to come to MetLife to watch the games. I'd have big suites filled with all my friends, and all you people, whoever wanted to go. You have no idea what it would be like if I was able to somehow pull that off and go back in time and get Bitcoin. Or if I won Lotto, you, have, you guys have no idea what I would do. If I won Lotto, you guys have no idea. I'd get like three luxury suites in that MetLife Stadium. I'd make sure everybody has good transportation to get there. I'd have limos pick you up. And we would have the time of our lives. It would be absolutely outstanding. I would do that pretty much every game. So... You're going to add lounge to that tattoo? No, I'm not adding lounge to the tattoo. Jets Chaos is me. I'm Jets Chaos. You know what I mean? Just because I, I changed the name of the channel doesn't mean that I change. I'm Jets Chaos. Hanging out in the... Uh, what, what's the name of my, my channel now? <laughs> Hanging out in Jets Lounge Chaos. <laughs> Love that tattoo. 
I'm getting Brooklyn put right here on my wrist, man. I'm going to have it written right across Brooklyn. I'm going to do it in that fiery flames font. I don't know, man. Should I get like the orange, yellow, like red flames that say Brooklyn right here on my forearm? Or should I get it like just in green? Like the old fashioned, just green, you know, or black or blue, whatever tattoo, you know, or should I, I don't know, man, but I, I got to get Brooklyn right on my forearm right here. I want Brooklyn right across my forearm. I don't want it to be big, big like the whole forearm. It's just got to be like four to five inches across, small lettering like this. You see on my fingers? Just get Brooklyn put right from here to here. Just Brooklyn. The only thing is I can't hide that from my parents. So I got to I gotta like get ready and prepare myself to go home and have them see me with a tattoo. Because, I mean, my dad knows and he, he, the first thing he said to me was, do not show that to your mother. So, I don't know. Cass, please take the helmet. I don't know computer. I don't know computer. I don't know computer. Merry Christmas. It will look better in your lounge. Are you crazy, man? You want me to take the helmet? That's crazy. How about I take the helmet and I do another giveaway or something with... Uh, with, with uh, Italy Jet. I'll, I'll I'll talk to him. I mean, don't get me wrong. I would love that helmet. Who signed it? Like some, it's a signed helmet, isn't it? Why don't you want it, Tony? I mean, but look, if you really don't want it, I mean, I guess I could take it. I guess it would look kind of cool back here, right? I'll find a way to like put it up on the screen. Hmm. I'm getting rid of them. These banners behind me. Not rid of like this this banner from Phil Adams. I'll never get rid of. But eventually I'm gonna have the neon jets light behind me. That's gonna be dark. And then maybe I'll put I'll have the banners when I'm like on the road traveling. But I don't know. I'll figure it all out, guys. I gotta redo the studio, make it real. Keep saying it, but I've got to do it at some point. So are you a Nets fan as well? Me, I'm not a Nets fan. Uh, I don't. I don't have anything against the Nets, and I'm, you know, and I'm not going to sit there and say I'm like the biggest Knicks fan either. I mean, I root for the Knicks, I guess. I mean, and I root for the Kings out here, but it's not even close to the Jets. The only thing close to my love of the Jets are the Mets. You know, like, like, and I love the, I like the Yankees too now living so far away and my wife getting me into the Yankees. So, um, you know, football and baseball for me and then basketball and hockey are a distant third and fourth. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, I just root for them. Like if the Knicks are in the playoffs, yeah, I watch it. I root for them. Yeah. And if they lose, it's whatever. It's not the same thing because like when the jets lose in the playoffs, I'm like, I can't talk for a week. Like I'm depressed. I'm, it breaks my heart. You know, it's not the same thing. So love is a strong word. Uh, thanks for the super chat, Tony. I appreciate it. I'll talk to Gina uh, Italy Jet and see how he feels about that. That's wild, though. Green Bean's going to be pissed. Yo, man, why is he getting me in? I'm Green Bean, man. Why are you giving it to that bull fuck? <laughs> he cheats. He cheated. He set it up that Tony won. <laughs> he cheated. That's what he's going to say, that I'm a cheater. I rigged the whole thing. <laughs> uh, so I'm watching this old Jets game. It's kind of crazy. Who's that? Somebody. Oh, that's Lagerman. Is that Jeff Lagerman? No. He wasn't on the team that long. No. Was he? May have been. Uh, that was a surprising pick. When they, Remember they drafted Lagerman? Any of you remember that? So it was like projected mid-round second pick. The Jets took him at like 16 or something. <laughs> so Tony Alexia won a helmet. Um, uh, Italy Jet did a giveaway. What? Um, and he won it. You know, he's trying to give it to me. What's hilarious? Me making fun of Green Bean? I hope that's what you, I hope that's what you're saying is hilarious. I hope that you say my imitation of Green Bean. Because let me tell you something. I'm thinking of getting a beard, like a fake white beard. I'm going to wear a Jets hat, and I'm going to do a whole show as Green Bean. Like I'm literally going
to uh, my channel for the day. But, man, dudes, what's up, man? Here to talk about the Jets. Snoop Dogg, what's up? Something. Sometimes he goes by Snoopy. I froze again, didn't I? Do we have any chance to get Aaron Rodgers without stuff? Um, I mean, I, I would say it was more that, like, it didn't hurt having Robert Sala, having a respected coach. I think there were other respectable coaches we could have had. I think the key thing was Joe Douglas building a team. You know, Joe Douglas built the team. Um that made us attractive. So I'm not going to say Sala was the only person who could have been the coach where we could have gotten Aaron Rodgers, but I would say that based on every other hire we've ever done at GM, I don't think we have Rodgers if we didn't get, if we didn't have Joe Douglas, like I think Joe Douglas and what he did to our team in the last two to three years is why we have Aaron Rodgers. Um, I think that Sala was an important piece. I think that if we had Adam Gase with Joe Douglas building this great talent, but it was Adam Gase, I don't think we get Aaron Rodgers. Um, I think there's there's a bunch of coaches we probably wouldn't have gotten. Um, wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have been interested in coming because he seems like there's a lot of sl sleazy type coaches, you know, that aren't really genuine, that have reputations, you know, and I don't think that Rodgers was going to put up with any of that stuff. I think uh, one of the things that was attractive to him was – not only the team that JD is building, but I think that the reputation of Robert Sala definitely helped. And I think that's true with a lot of the players that want to play here. I think there's a, there's a, a, a you know, a mutual feeling like that, that um, people want to, you know, players want to play for the Jets because they're reputable coaches. Like they, they have good reputations, you know, not just Sala, but the, 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 the coordinators. I think that, you know, if you're a defensive back and you and you look at the Jets and you see Tony Ogden as the coach, you're looking at the guy for 18 years has been a defensive back coach that, you know, and, and does it. And he's a respected guy. So I, I, I you know, I think. Uh, I, I think it's. um, I think that it was just all the right pieces. I think you could credit Joe Douglas the most, but. Robert Sala, um, the hiring, obviously, of Hackett didn't hurt, obviously. Um, Sauce Gardner, Garrett Wilson, Brees Hall, guys like Quinton Williams, C.J. Mosley, um, those type of players. I think it was the combination of all those things. That Aaron Rodgers said, "Yeah, I can go there and I can play there." That's a again. Saying that's a place I can go play. Do I think Salah can improve? I think he did improve second year from first year, and I think he's going to improve now. I think absolutely, absolutely, he's learning how to be a head coach. And I think it's nice that we were finally patient, like we finally are going by the character and the person, and just an understanding. Give them, give him some time. Let's let him learn. It was different with LaFleur. You couldn't wait any longer because we had to win now. And number two, LaFleur has a giant gap in his resume right now as a person that Robert Sala doesn't have because it's not just Mike LaFleur's learning how to be a coordinator. Michael Sala, I mean, Robert LaFleur, or Mike LaFleur, <laughs> Mike LaFleur, his problem right now is, is he ever going to get over the hump of being able to have relationships with people? Because apparently he couldn't, he had no, he, he lost the locker room. So that's that's a problem. So he's going to have to learn more than just the experience of being an offensive coordinator. Lafleur is going to learn have have to learn how to be a leader, a person that gets along with other people that knows how to lead other people. Whereas Robert Sala just needs the you know he's going to gain and get better and better every year, just the experience of being a head coach. But he doesn't need any more growth in people skills. So Robert Sala is all about that. Yeah, if we had Sean Payton, yeah. I mean, depending on – unless Rodgers has some issue against Sean Payton. No, I never heard that he did. Um, 
But yeah, if I'm a, I think any player, Sean Payton's very respected. I don't know, you know, I think, you know, remember he won one Super Bowl, but he, he's a great coach. I mean, he's a very solid coach, really good reputation, right? I mean, it's like there's no taking it away from him. But I just don't like to go too crazy over him because he only won one Super Bowl and he had Drew Brees. So that makes me think, that, don't get me wrong, one's enough. I'll take it. I'll take any head coach now that can win us one Super Bowl. Don't don't misunderstand me. I'm just saying, Sean Payton has to turn around the Denver Broncos and do something real if he wants to go down as a great coach. Like if he really wants to go down as a great coach, he needs to do something with Denver. And if he does something with Denver, if he turns them around, I'm not saying he has to win a Super Bowl right away, but if he makes them a championship level team, competing back within the next two years, maybe not this. season right away and it starts to become indisputable that he's one of the best you know like he's a top coach in the nfl that he can go to a team that you know and quickly turn it around but um i think he needs to do it one more time with another team how many hours do you think jd and sala spend at one jets drive daily oh wow I think Sala probably, depending on the time of year, he has a lot of kids and he seems like a family man. I think he gets up at like 4.30 a.m. I think he does his workout. He's an intense, intense health nut uh, and physical, you know, like guy. Like, so he's a fitness freak. So I think he gets up probably 4.35 or whatever, super early, does his workout gets in and starts his day at 6, like 6, 6.30 or whatever it is. And he probably stays till sit like 12 hours, maybe. Like when it's not the crazy time, he probably goes home because he needs to have time with his family because he just seems like that kind of guy. But that's a lot of time. A lot of people say they work 12 hours a week, uh, 12 hours a day, but you know they're full of crap. I think he's there and he's working. Um, also I think what's different is he's not just working five days. I think he's there every day. And I think in certain parts of the year, he takes days off, but I think during these times, like for a good, you know, when the, before the draft, and then maybe he takes a break. I don't know. Um, but I think during the camps and the, and during the season, you know, he's working seven days a week. He's working seven days a week, maybe on Monday when the guys are off. He only comes in for four or five hours, maybe. Because they you, you can't burn out. It's a marathon. You can't burn yourself out. But um, he probably works even more hours on, at, during that time. I just don't know. I, I think people put too much on the amount of on, on the like the, the amount of time that you work instead of the quality, like quality, you know, quantity over quality. I, I'm a person who, honestly, I could work for eight hours and say, or 10 hours and say, I had a 10 hour day today versus another day where I'm only in for four hours, but I was much more productive and got a lot more done the four hours because the quality was a lot better. But um, I think those guys work a lot. I think they work a lot. But he doesn't have to do it all. Remember, he has coordinators, they're spending hours doing it too. So, you know. 16 hours a day. That's rough if he is, but I could see that during the certain parts of the season. Yeah. Like during the week, I could see him working 16 hours a day during the week, like during the, during the, during the football weeks, like during the season, I could see him not taking a break. He's constantly doing stuff. Even when they travel and they get to a hotel, he's got to make sure everybody's in their rooms. He's got to make sure. I mean, he has people to do that, but he's overseeing it. He's, he's responsible for everything those guys are doing during the season. You know, and he's looking at tape constantly. He's looking at possible strategies. He's getting injury reports. He's getting who's available, uh, who's going to be on the 53 this week, which who's going to dress, which 48 are going to dress, like everything. I mean, they're constantly making decisions, constantly analyzing things. Broncos won't be good for the next 10 years. I don't know. Well, that's the Sean Payton test because they have good players on their roster. There's nothing wrong with the Broncos. I mean, unless Russ Wilson is totally 
but it's very hard to believe that's true. I think that Russ Wilson needed to, you know, needed someone like Sean Payton to come smack him in the face and say, get your head out of your ass, get your head out of the clouds. You're not a God. You're a regular guy. And the proof is you sucked last year. And now we're going to work hard and we're going to redeem yourself. And if he can do that and he can get Russ, Russ, William to, Russ Wilson to play better, he has a very good defense in Denver. And they have a very strong home field advantage with that thin air. It's no joke. JT Jets, Jets, Jets. Eminon. Eminon. How did we used to say it? Do, 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 do. Eminon. Do, do. Do, 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 do. I'm Super Leroy is here saying Salah and JD eat football. <laughs> well, you gotta live, you, you gotta, right? There's no faking it. You gotta love the game. Well, we know Gase was probably at the facility 24-7 because he didn't even know what his family was doing for Thanksgiving. And, and you know, and that's the proof that it's quality over quantity, right? I mean, yeah, Gase was always there, but it didn't do anything. Didn't mean anything. Didn't get us wins, did it? Didn't get us what we wanted. So I'll take quality over quantity any day of the week. I I am not one to judge that. Like if they said Salah took two days off and your fans say, what the fuck? He doesn't care. What the hell? So, like people, it's like yeah, he's a human being with kids and a family. It's like people, you know, that we're all people. It's a job. You know, like, don't question people's dedication. It's a job. People, self-care matters. And you want him to have strong self-care because you don't want someone to burn out. You don't want him to burn out. You want him to have the right balance. And to me, it's all about quality. It's like, what scheme is he putting together? Is he using the right strategy? Is he growing as a play caller? Is he, as a decision maker, is he going to call the timeout next year? I mean, like, there's some situational coaching that needs to improve with him. You know, we all saw it against in that game against um, Detroit. Like, there's some he has some ways to go. Like, there's no ifs ands or buts. I don't care if somebody else was responsible for time. It doesn't matter. He's the head coach, and it comes back to him. It was inexcusable. We ran 20 seconds off the clock, and then we ended up running out of time where we only needed one more play to get into field goal range. It's no excuse. The head coach has to take that. Has to take that. And there was a couple of incidents like that last year. So Robert Sala has got to grow as a situational coach. Simple. It's it, it. But but he's a second year coach. He's a second year coach. I'm okay with it. I'm okay with him having to learn. There are some guys who they might be able to start out, and they're a great coach immediately. And then there are some guys that might grow into being a great coach. I think his temperament, his personality, his ethics, his morality, his knowledge of the game, his ability to connect with players, his ability to communicate, I think these are things that all are like the most important ingredients to leadership. I think he's a brilliant defensive mind. He's an innovator. He's just not, he's not just copying. He's actually innovates and actually is the kind of defense one day that people will copy because he actually changes it. He doesn't just play a scheme and look at other people's tape and say, this is how you play this scheme. He actually <laughs> is the guy that goes out and looks for smaller linebackers. He's changing the game to his scheme. He's doing that. So I think he has potential to be a great coach. And I think it was showing last year. And then I think losing the offensive line like, got to a point where we couldn't run the ball. And there's only so much you can do when you don't have a quarterback. So he was winning without a quarterback. But then when we lost the running game and teams said, oh, shit, there's no Brees Hall and they have no offensive line, let's just stack the box and tell this quarterback that they have to try to beat us now. And the quarterback – just couldn't do it because he didn't have the protection. He didn't have the skill. We didn't have a quarterback that was good enough to overcome a, a battered offensive line. We had our one, our, our number one quarterback lost his cool, got the yips. The backup got hurt. The other guy was a statue. He was an old man who clearly was way out of his prime. 
So that was it. But now, you know, Roger stays healthy. Offensive line stays healthy. I mean, I see Robert Sala as a defensive-minded coach who only took two years in his second season, made us a top-five defense that's getting better. And I see a, a coach that knowingly and understandably needs veteran offensive coaches because that's not his thing. And I think that he's making the right decision. He's bring he's brought in a great team of offensive coaches. Um, Hackett got that head coaching job in Denver, that opportunity for a reason. He did something right. Um, the guys from Tennessee, those coaches from Tennessee, huge to me. I think people don't talk about it enough because if you look at the performance of Tennessee and their offensive line in the last few years. Um, it's an impressive resume for, 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 I think his name is Carter, right? That coach. So I I'm excited about it. I'm excited about the coaching staff now. And I think that this will be the year that Salah established himself as a very good NFL coach. This is where, you know, because the jets going to be great and people are going to look at the coach, but if he wants to be a great coach, he'll have to keep somehow keep the team from being sucky when Rogers leaves. Like in two years from now, he has to keep it going. We can't just drop down to two and thirteen and say uh, two and fifteen and say, "Oh, well, I lost. We lost Rodgers." But I think he was. Look, if the offensive line would have stayed healthy, if Brees Hall was stayed, you know, was stayed healthy, and and uh, we didn't lose AVT, and we would have just had a respectable offensive line. I think you saw Robert Sala coaching a team to be a playoff team with the thirty-second best quarterback in the NFL. I think that shows that we have a potentially very good head coach. Um, because there are a lot of head coaches, you give them the 32nd best quarterback in the league, they're not winning five games. And I don't care who else you put on the team. I will, uh, you know, it's good to t stop and relive the pain. It's good. It's good to relive the pain. It's good to remember where we're coming from. Keeps us humble. I feel that this is the year that we're going to – Gase is the definition of a burnout. Exactly. Uh, yeah, Pete Carroll was good. Yeah, I mean, look, he was young. I, I mean, I didn't understand it. I, I, I honestly – Naming Geno Smith, Geno Smith. But the one thing that sticks out of my head is Geno Smith's last game as a Jet. He played really well. He had a great game against the Miami Dolphins, and we beat them. And it's and I don't care if you're out of the playoffs; it's always a big deal to beat the Miami Dolphins, right? They're a rivalry. We always love to win. Um, I don't think that. Geno Smith got enough of a chance for us. I don't see how people can think he did. Like, how did he? He was still so young. He only got – was it one season or two? I think he only got one season even. Like, it was so weird that we made a decision on Geno Smith. I mean, not that he not that he needed only one more. He probably would have needed more time because when he went to be the backup in, you know, for the Giants and, you know, you know, even in Seattle two years ago when he came in for uh, Russ – Wilson, he didn't look so good. But maybe he just needed the playing time. Maybe he would have been great for us by year three. Maybe he's going to stink this year. And last year was just that fluky, you know, career season that he's never going to see again. We don't know. We don't know. So, I mean, I know that Russ Wilson didn't look good with another coach. But Geno Smith looked good with Pete Carroll. So maybe it's a coaching thing. Maybe it's a system. Is this are the Dolphins going to come back in this game? Is that why it was Mark Ingram's players? Choice game. The Jets were up a lot, and now I see the Dolphins scoring touchdowns. <laughs> it's like it's amazing. It was that game from the past. I forgot what happened in it. And because I forgot what happened, I care. <laughs> oh, my God. Was that hasty? I think Hasty's the one that gave it up. Oof. It's Marino celebrating. Shut up, Marino. You know how many – hey, buddy, 
You know how many Super Bowls he ended up winning? Sorry, guys. Every time I see Marino acting all tough, I have to yell that out. Oh, Jets 24, Miami 21. <laughs> we were up 21 to 6. 24 to 6, the Jets were up. It's 24 21. 10 minutes to go. Ay, ay, ay. Anybody remember that game? Dolphins suck, follow Jets passengers. <laughs> Chubb still don't break out. That's why Denver traded him. Chubb? Chubb? Anyway, what time is it? <clears throat> Maybe I should just stay all day. Maybe I just won't get off air. I'm just going to sit here all day. I'm going to watch this game. I do have to leave to get some soda. Right now I'm down to ice water. Yeah, it's water. Went to Del Taco for lunch. Got some chicken snack rollers. Chipotle sauce. It's good. Super Leroy. Not just Leroy. Super Leroy. I lost 600 bucks because of that game. Had a three-game parlay, and the Jets screwed me. Is it the game I'm watching right now? Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> it looks like the Jets are about to score. Wait a second. Was that a big – who was that, 80? In the, who was number 80 for the Jets in 1994? Because that was definitely before Corbett's time. Monk in motion. Ooh. Oh, this is ugly, man. Oh, the Jets. So I guess that means we lost, Twisted? I knew we were in trouble when it said Mark Ingram's choice, right? Because wasn't he a Dolphin? Like He's not going to pick a game that the Jets win. He's going to pick a game where they come back and beat us. I remember these names. It's weird. It's so It's like forever ago. Like, in some ways, 1993 doesn't seem that long ago, or 94. I remember college. I remember it like it was yesterday. But when I watch the games and see the players, I don't remember anything. Like, I don't remember watching this. Like, there was another 85 who played on the Jets? Like, no, that's like, that's Wesley's number. <laughs> Jeez. Poor Pete Carroll. Think about him. He was young. Now he's an old man. It sucks. Now I'm going to make Twisted sad. I'm going to depress everybody. James Thornton. Mm. Well, Wayne Corbett did a lot better with the number. You know who else was number 80? Jerry Rice. You can look it up. Jerry Rice wore number 80. Yeah, I grew up watching him play. Hasn't been a wide receiver that even comes close. I mean, there's some, there's some great ones. I know people like people say, oh, what about Calvin Megatron? Oh, you know, what about Randy Moss? I'm telling you, there was no one like Rice. There's no one like Rice. He's the best. The best. There's almost every game. It's just waiting for it to happen. Every time the Niners had the ball, you're just waiting. You know at any moment... They're going to throw a pass to Jerry Rice, and he's going to just take off, and no one's he's going to just outrun the entire defense. He did it every week, week after week. It was ridiculous. I'm frozen in time. I'm frozen with no wine. All righty, so let's talk like we're green bean again, man. Man, it's Taylor ham, eggs, and cheese, man. If you're calling it pork roll, it's not pork roll, man. They might call it pork roll, but everybody knows you say Taylor ham. 
because that's the only one that tastes the right way on an egg and cheese sandwich, man. I don't know what Nick Shine's problem is saying pork roll. Who comes into a store and says, I want pork roll on my roll with egg and cheese, man? It's Taylor Ham, man. Let me, let me do another green beanism. Let me chew on my straw. Pretend it's a pen. James Thornton, number 80. I got it. Mitchell. Matt, you weren't even alive. You weren't even alive. But I, I guess you have Google. Screen pass. So number 39. Don't know who the hell you are. Ooh. Who is that? Jay Johnson. Oh, Johnny Johnson. That's right. He played with Boomer Esiason, I remember. John Johnny Johnson used to be on the... Um, Cardinals. I remember he was, he used to kill the Giants. He was a giant killer. He was our entire offense this year. Now it's coming back to me. Johnson was our best player this year. He caught passes, he ran the ball, he did every he did everything. Carl Lawson says Rogers trade or signing was because of a unique connection with the quarterback. Oh, sounds good to me. I didn't know he had a unique connection with the quarterback. I, I like it. Larry just, I mean, um, Twisted just ruined this game for me. <laughs> yeah, we lost. It's one of the many times, you know, once we lost Ken O'Brien, we couldn't keep up with Dan Marino. Boomer Esiason. He had a couple of good years for Cincinnati. He went to a Super Bowl. And then he just became another shrug, regular, average quarterback. So I'm so tired of, I'm so glad that we're drafting stars and we're not just signing guys because it never is the same. It's so rare. I'm not saying it never happens, but it's so rare that you have, you know, you have got a superstar playing on another team and you sign them. They come to your team and they it's like very rare. They never do the same thing. Like, I'm not talking about Aaron Rodgers because that's a quarterback. I'm talking about like receivers and running backs, linebackers. They have these great careers, and then you get them at 31, 32 years old. And then you learn why the other team gave up on them. Well, even with quarterbacks, but we have to hope that Aaron Rodgers is an exception, like Tom Brady and Peyton Manning, that they still have something left. I think Aaron Rodgers is going to be fine because we don't even need him to be the prime Aaron Rodgers. We just need him to not be. Tenth best. Poof. Froze again. I'm trying to highlight this message. Snowball says he was at Hofstra when Corbett was there. I graduated two years before him. Did you have a drink of beer with him? Huh? Huh? Dakota says, love the Jets. Love this specific Jets team, team so damn much. So do I, man. I really do. I really love these guys. I love this team. I mean, we watched it get built together, right? I mean, we spent the last few years on YouTube and Twitter arguing, fighting, yelling, agreeing, yelling, crying, yet laughing. I mean, all that we've been through, but we literally watched this team get built. How could we not love it? I love Jay. Jay he was a tackling. He was a tackle-breaking machine. Yeah, man, he's a beast. I met him when I first moved out to the Bay Area after college. I worked at the Marriott in Santa Clara. And even though their stadium wasn't always there, their training camp was in Santa Clara, right by the Marriott. So that's where they would stay. And JJ was, I don't even know if he made the team. They had, they brought, after he was with the Jets, they brought JJ into training camp. And he, and I was the guy who checked him in. And I sent like shit to his room and stuff. And I wrote a note saying, you rocked it for the Jets. Thanks for all the great memories. He never 
came and said thanks or anything like that, but it was cool. I think I pissed him off because when he came up, I said, man, you were awesome. You used to crush the Giants when you played for the Cardinals. He goes, yeah. I go, and then you got stuck with Boomer Esiason. Sorry. And he got all quiet. And I think maybe now as an older person, because I was young back then, now I realize they might be buddies, you know? They, these guys are like brothers. You know, they go to war together. And maybe he didn't like that comment so much. But, I mean, I was bitter. I've always been bitter about Boomer, Boomer Esiason because he's like so many of the free agents we get that do great things everywhere else, and then they come to us, and they don't do anything. Who's that, number 30? Is that Anderson's? No, that's not the right time. 1994. Could be Richie Anderson, right? He's so senile. I don't even know. I know that James Hasty was me, it was on this team, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't too long that he ended up on uh, Kansas City, though. Kansas City stole our entire secondary, our entire secondary in the mid nineties. They, they took everybody. Let's see what happens. They're at the 42-yard line. Boomer Siason under center. He snaps back. He's throwing deep. And it is intercepted. <laughs> it's intercepted by number 37. Number 86, Mitchell, the tight end, makes the tackle. And the Jets and Boomer Siason walk off the field dejected. Boomer looks like, you know what Boomer's face is saying? They paid me a lot, but. I didn't realize, man, what meant, being a Jet meant. Well, you're the one that threw the interception. Ugh. He had plenty of time. No excuse. You stink, Boomer. We're down 24 to 21. We're up 24 to 21. Marching down the field. Could put the game away. Instead, he throws an interception. And this is what Larry was talking about. So, uh, all right, everybody. I'll let you go back to your normal Tuesday schedule programming. I'm sure someone's going to jump on. Who, who usually goes on at four o'clock? Somebody does, but no one I know. But anyway, we'll be back for the Wacky Wednesday show tomorrow. Just thought I'd come on and hang out for a little bit. Thanks to everybody who joins and hung out. Dakota, Snowball, Red John, Twisted, Super Leroy, Matthew Smith, Stephen T, Eminon. Who is that? I need a dick. <laughs> I need a dick. I need a dick. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. Tony Alexio, Chris Bradigan. <laughs> Uh, DFF1234, let me just say everybody's name. Peter, David Gerard, what's up, my brother? Thanks for coming today. Jennifer Slattery, she tried to change her name. It didn't work. Proud New York Jets fan. That's Nick Shine, the guy I like to beat up. Peter. Jets. And uh, let's see, anybody else I'm missing? I think I got you all. Said all your names. Chiefs Live. Well, there's a lot of you here today. It wasn't as bad as I thought. John Bushnell. Thanks for coming, man. Thanks for hanging out today. Aaron Doc, Fly Guy. Aaron Duck, Fly Guy. <laughs> we could just make a whole show out of me trying to pronounce people's names. It would be a lot of fun. But we won't do that today. Today, I'll go and I'll leave you with, uh, what's a fun one? I would All regret right. it if people look back at the first episode and you weren't on it. Yeah, well, I like that. It's called Forward Thinking. That's one of the worst beats in the world. We do. Our, our beat is horrible. Connor could shove that article up his ass. And then I went to that game, and I was like, this is the greatest team I've ever seen in my life. I'm a Jet fan. This is going to be the greatest run ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, because if they take a Quano, I'm not complaining. Joe Douglas is the king. The king 
of keeping shit close to the vest. A two of four and a six for Darnold? Did the Jets really ruin Sam Darnold? Or did Sam Darnold just suck all along and we were just trying to talk ourselves into it? And Hamilton is a player who could potentially make a very big impact. And suddenly here we are today, you can't get rid of him. Right, it's like a play. Joe Douglas was hired because he's not those general managers. Okay, Luscious. Somebody is going to fall just like Elijah Moore did, just like Michael Carter did. You know, what would, if you had one sentence to say to Joe Douglas, what would you say? So you would say, you had me at hello, and then give him a big old wet one right on the smack. <laughs> <laughs>